Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's first study of the week, covering part 10 of these articles. Now, as this is a new week, we know that from Scripture that our Father's mercies are new every day. So shall we ask him for his guidance so that we may more carefully consider these articles, the words that are written, and the points that we need to fix in our minds? Shall we now ask for this guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, We come before you and we thank you for this opportunity we have to study, to consider, to address, and to see what we are able to find within these articles. We ask, Father, that our minds may be open. We ask for your blessing and your direction. We do not look to criticize, Father. We look to understand. But we also need, Father, to be able to understand according to that which you have set before us previously. Direct us now. Help us each one so that as we are discussing and assessing these articles, that we may be able to understand more clearly that which you have presented before us and to see what light we may be able to glean from these articles. Help us now, Father. Please send your spirit so that our minds may be open. Please send your angels to protect us, each one. We need you in all ways and in all things. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, Father, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we left off in these two paragraphs on Thursday. Here, the quotation is made from Revelation 9-2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The premise is stated, close to the conclusion, that atheism is portrayed as a beast, as opposed to Islam, which is portrayed as smoke. Smoke and incense denote the prayers of the people. Here, Revelation 8.4 is being recommended. Atheism does not send up any prayers to any god, but Islam sends up its prayers into the heavens to Allah, portrayed as smoke, obscuring from its people the worship of the true God. The Quran is not compatible with the Holy Bible as it denies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is the source of the smoke from the bottomless pit and is directed against God's word. As we were addressing on Thursday, Atheism cannot be the beast, yet here he states it as such and then wishes to contrast this with the smoke of Islam. Nowhere in Revelation 9-2 is incense being referred to, so he brings this up using Revelation 8-4. Now, in this with Revelation 8-4, we would read and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascend up before god and out of the angels hands so why make the application combining the smoke and incense as being a portion of islam and that that's what he seems to be saying here yeah so so one is we know that islam is not being portrayed as smoke right 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 so it's obviously they're going to be they're going to be locusts the smoke that we've understood is uh the teachings of islam um, not necessarily the prayers of islam right okay so and then out of that you know the smokes the locusts are going to come which are going to be islam itself now so there's there's a bunch of things here. Obviously, our understanding of Revelation 9 has been well established. We know that uh, this uh, star that falls from heaven, we mark as being Muhammad. Right. And, and he's going to be given the key of the bottomless pit. So the key of the bottomless pit we have as 
So, you know, Christ is going to have a key as well, right? The key of the house of David. And here we have the key of the bottomless pit. And they seem to be in contrast with each other. Would that make sense? Yes. Okay. Well, Christ has also got the keys to uh, death. Yeah. Hades. Yeah. Hell and death. Yeah. That's true as well. But the the other point, and this is this is a reason for my confusion. He wishes to quote Revelation eight four, which has to do with the seventh seal and the golden censer. Mm-hmm. And I'm not seeing the interrelationship with the seventh seal here. Now, am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. It's just that he's picking up on this word. These are, you know, because he's looking at the word smoke. And then he's making an interpretation of the smoke without taking into consideration everything else. So so this is kind of a mixture of ideas that we've had, but it's 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 not it's not logical or consistent. Like because he's arguing atheism does not send up any prayers to any God. So uh, um, so is he is he trying to say that this bottomless pit has to do with atheism generally? Right. Like he's not really clear because he seems to have taken the position that. Because we know that this is a satanic power, power, that's what the bottomless pit, the abyssus, right? The abyss. Right. The abyssus, yes. Right. Abyssus. But we know that it's not. It's not a symbol of atheism, right? It's it's a symbol of a satanic power when we deal with the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, this new manifestation that is, that he says is atheism. Well, that beast is actually France coming out of the bottomless pit is not what makes it atheist. It's that it's Sodom and Egypt. Well, the Egypt part makes it atheist, right? Okay. So he hasn't really, he hasn't really explained things properly. He hasn't explained his reasons behind his conclusions, right? He hasn't, he isn't giving us, you know, his math. He's not showing how he's done his work. Right. Yeah. So he's making these, these connections. Now, sometimes, I mean, I do that too. I, you know, I just assume that people know the connections I'm making. And, and so, you know, once, once I show them to somebody, they'll say, oh, okay, now that makes sense. Because sometimes these are connections that we've made before, and I assume people know them. But he's presenting something that doesn't really follow from what we've understood in the past. So he would really need to explain, here's what we used to think. Here's why I think this now. So either he hasn't really thought it through clearly, or, you know, that that he's unsure of what he's saying, or it's just that he's obscuring what what his reasoning that is he doesn't want us to know what he's thinking or why he draws these conclusions because we might examine them and disagree with them right so people can present things in such a way that they obscure their reasoning because their their reasoning isn't good so i don't know which it is whether he just doesn't understand his own reasoning or whether he's trying to obscure it that's the way I would look at it anyway. The, the sad point for me, as I'm looking at this, he wants the atheism to be portrayed as a beast, which it could not be. Right, it'd be France. Now, if he was if he was truly following Miller's rules, he mm-hmm. would bring all of the verses together to form his conclusion regarding the smoke. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting that smoke in the New Testament, is referred to 13 times. Mm -hmm. You have one verse in Acts and 12 verses in Revelation. So the conclusion stating smoke and incense denote the prayers of the people are, I mean, that is supported in Revelation 8.4, but yet his premise that Islam is smoke is very much set aside because Revelation 9.3 states that came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, 
if the smoke is Islam, then what are the locusts that come out of Islam? Right. So, so we understand the smoke to be the false doctrines and teachings of Muhammad. Okay. Right. Now, and him having the key to the bottomless pit just is referring to the fact that his teachings are going to come from Satan. Okay. But now, the the other reason that I would have a problem with this has to deal with Revelation fourteen eleven which reads, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, in this situation, if I was to accept his premise on this, that verse would then have to be interpreted, and the Islam of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the atheism and atheism's image and whosoever receiveth the mark of atheism's name yeah so so the problem there is first he hasn't shown us that smoke represents atheism or or islam anywhere right right but he is going to show that it represents the prayers of the saints Right. So smoke. Obviously, it's incense. Right. It's not even just smoke, though. It's incense. So it's a different type of smoke. I mean, smoke from incense is quite a bit different than smoke, smoke from a pit, a burning pit. Right. So it's 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 tied to a completely different image. Right. Correct. So so to 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 sort of just jump over there to that one verse and say, well, you know, this has to do with the prayers of Islam, so it's Islam. Even if it was the prayers of the of Islam, it wouldn't be Islam itself. Right. So it doesn't even follow. But we, we understand it to be uh, not prayers and not Islam, but the teachings of Muhammad. Right. But yeah, I don't I, I don't I don't follow his reasoning here. Okay. Now, and and it, you know it's interesting in the next in the next article he's going to bring up this whole thing about you know bringing all the statements together every word must be have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible, and and of course he he often quotes Miller's rules and never follows them. Right now, his next premise: Islam is on the same side of the war as is the papacy and atheism. That's kind of a broad stroke statement. When well. We- yeah, because, I mean, they're all obviously opposed to God's word against the truth, but he has tried to say that they're sort of, you know, working together, which they're Correct. not. Okay. And and we'll see later why he's, why he's trying to clump them all together. Okay. When we stop to consider the role of each of these powers, we can see clearly that they are each, in their own distinct way, engaged in a war that is directed especially against the scriptures. It should be noted that each of these persecuting powers, paganism, papalism, apostate Protestantism, atheism, and Islam, respectively, are neutralizing, negating, or changing the scriptures to make them of none effect. Their war is against the scriptures and not against themselves. This singular point of attack forms the basis for unity throughout the range of these persecuting powers. Well, I disagree with his his comment, mm-hmm. especially where he states their war is against the scriptures and not against themselves. I guess that what's gone on in the world of the Levant has not penetrated well at this point because Sunni versus Shiite is something that's gone on for quite a while. Yeah, and and uh, to me also to argue that somehow Islam has not been at war with the papacy is I mean, I mean that, they, they're, they're they're not the same power. We can't group them together as as the same power as united in any sense. I mean, obviously they're opposed to God's people as well. 
But just because people have common enemies doesn't mean they are not enemies. The situation here is very simple. From the days of Abu Bakr to the days of the Crusades to the present day, Islam has ascended whenever the papacy has ascended. Mm -hmm. Islam has descended whenever the papacy has descended. Mm -hmm. To try to say that Islam and the papacy are not at war with each other is historically totally inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And we know that Islam was not created by the papacy. Exactly. I mean, technically the papacy as such didn't exist at the time Islam arose. I mean, Catholicism did, but the papacy didn't have any kind of power. They didn't have the Jesuits, you know, at that time, right? They, You're okay. superimposing some later sort of um, uh, Catholicism over a time in which it didn't really have that sort of power. It couldn't have created. They were just rising, really, in, in that period. I mean, we could say, well, you know, in the sixth century when Islam arose, you know, the papacy had, had this power in Europe. But they definitely weren't paying any attention to what was happening in, um, you know, the Arab countries. And how, how could they create, create Islam? Islam is a satanic power. Muhammad was, you know, if he was visited by any sort of angel, it was a satanic angel. There's still questions whether he ever actually was ever even visited by any anything, you know. But if he was, it definitely wasn't a uh, a Catholic priest who convinced him uh, to start his deception. It's just ignoring history, right? It's trying to make history of no effect in order to try to make a point within the reader's mind that he knows what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Now, any other comment at this point before I read this this next paragraph? Okay. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Revelation 8.13 the children of Ishmael overrun the face of the earth in the form of the three woes. As a scourge, first is Mohammedism, then is the Ottoman Empire, and finally is the third woe of our time, that of Islam. They will be against every nation, and every nation will be against them. Okay, now, so when he talks about the three woes here, right? he's saying the first woe is just Mohammedism, the second woe is the Ottoman Empire, Yes, that's the way right. I would read it. But the second woe begins with the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Right. So I'm not really sure what he's trying to say, whether he doesn't fully understand the uh, Revelation 9. Well, the, the first woe begins with the rise of the Ottoman Empire as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. So, I, I mean, there is the second woe. Oh, I said the second woe? Yeah, yeah I mean, did. First woe. Okay, yeah, so... Well, the second woe is from uh, that's going to deal with the fall of of Constantinople, right? That period. But the Ottoman Empire begins the first woe, yeah. So, but he's saying that the first woe is Mohammedism, and the second woe is the Ottoman Empire, right? Is that what he's saying? Yes. Okay, which would not be correct. Now there is a period of five months. You know, from Abu Bakr's command until the the first treaty of Constantinople, but that's not the first woe, right? The first woe is going to be the five months mm -hmm. from you know July twenty seventh, twelve ninety nine to July twenty seventh, fourteen forty nine. The issue that I'm seeing here, this would be a <clears throat> a removing of the way marks that were established on both the 1843 and the 1850 charts. Mm -hmm. But does he understand the Revelation 9 or not? I'm 
at this point, I'm not going to assume from what he's been presenting, I would have to presume that he does not fully understand it. So now it could be that he's just taking the the woes as being the trumpets as well. So you could say, well, you got the first trumpet, that's going to be now that's going to, of course, include the first woe and the Ottoman Empire. But, you know, he could be just looking at that as being the woe with the rise of Mohammedism. And then, you know, the Ottoman Empire is being the the sixth trumpet. But that's still that would still be incorrect. And and I, I don't understand why Islam in our time is like different from Mohammedism. Like as far as, you know, to talk about Mohammedism or Islam, they're the same. It's just another word for the same thing. So I don't know. It's not it's not very precise and it's actually quite inaccurate. But it also would argue against his premise about Islam being on the side of atheism and the papacy because saying that they don't really fight against each other. OK, I don't disagree. His conclusion Here in the USA, it is the power of atheism that is striving for control. And although by all outward appearances, it seems that its triumph is certain, it will yet be seen that it cannot compete with apostate Protestantism. Atheism is being used by the papacy to swing the pendulum far to the left, knowing all the while that the resultant swing back to the right will bring in the Sunday law to our country. These two powers, the papacy and atheism, are once again working in tandem to bring a nation to ruin. Apostate Protestantism has been invested with the same power, seat, and great authority as paganism and papalism, and is now almost fully matured into spiritualism. Both atheism and Islam will yield to this power in the upcoming Sunday Law time period. Okay, so when was apostate Protestantism given the the power seat and great authority that paganism, pagan Rome passed to papal Rome? I don't see that, that it has. I don't see that he can establish a waymark for that. No. Well, the United States does not sit in Rome. No. The papacy sits in Rome. It's the one that still has the power seat and great authority that was passed to it. That receives a deadly wound, and that deadly wound will be healed, and the United States will make an image to the beast. But it's not the United States that's going to be worshipped. You know, the Antichrist is not going to be a president of the United States. Well, here again, stating that the papacy and atheism are once again working in tandem to bring a nation to ruin is akin to saying that the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate are working together. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the reason we're looking at this, I mean, I, I feel a bit bad in some ways, like going through this study and just seeing how nothing makes sense and having to point it out. But, you know, the purpose of doing this is we're trying to understand something, you know, not just something about other people's thinking, but even about our own thinking and how we draw conclusions. In a sense, we're saying, how do we follow Miller's rules? And, and we're, we're giving a contrast between the approach that we've used in studying Daniel's last vision, for instance, and how he's approaching this. And like this is sort of a mishmash of ideas and thoughts. They tend to be contradictory. Right. They don't they don't they don't really fit together. Um And even if if papacy is using atheism, atheism is not working in tandem with the papacy. It's a pawn. At at the very most, that's all you could say, right? Right. You know, it it would be, uh, but I would just think that the papacy just takes advantage of, of this. Now, Satan, he, of course, orchestrates these things you know, in his limited way in which he he works uh, through his deception, right? So he creates chaos and disorder. But you can't talk about them working in tandem, these different powers, because they're not working in tandem. They're enemies of each other. 
the papacy does not look at atheism as uh, a friend. Now, of course, atheism it has had its influence within the papacy itself. That is, some of the ideas that result from atheism, such as humanism and so forth, um, they have influenced the papacy. So none of these are really black and white in that sense. But the ultimate goal of the papacy is to have Catholicism be the religion of the world. Uh, atheism, of course, is, is a pretty broad, uh, you know, idea. We could talk about the globalists and, and they're connected to atheism. And atheism exists everywhere, right? It's some ways permeated society. In Canada, you know, we had, uh, I think it was the head of the United Church of Canada who was an atheist, which makes no sense, but or at least an agnostic. But um, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. As, as The conclusion that he's coming to one is he's just really stating uh, he hasn't he hasn't shown us any of this, and, and definitely to say that apostate Protestantism has been invested with the same power, seat, and great authority as paganism and papalism, and is almost fully matured into spiritualism makes no sense, and and I don't think that Islam is going to yield to the power of the upcoming Sunday Law. I don't think that's something that's shown in scriptures. I think I Islam. Is going to be uh, squashed as we I come don't into. I think you're going to find it in scripture or in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. <clears throat> now, here in his conclusion, he makes the following statement. The main purpose of this article is to show the larger context of Satan's war against God and his word. Satan is at war with God and not with himself. These three great persecuting powers are the highlight of the prophecy of Daniel 11 and are the direct counterfeit to the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Correctly understood, they reveal to us the strategy of Satan in this war. Not only are they a direct counterfeit to the three angels' messages, but the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are also a counterfeit to the Godhead itself. Thoughts on this paragraph? The problem that I'm having is that we're far enough into this particular article for him to be stating this is his main purpose would be, for me, a little late in the game. Which he hasn't really shown. Correct. Now he wishes to make a comparison that the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are a counterfeit to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but also they're trying to say that atheism or excuse me, paganism, papalism, and spiritualism are a counterfeit to the three angels' message of Revelation 14, but they're not. he's not trying to show how Revelation 18 ties in with this mess either. No, and I mean, things are grouped in threes. Um, obviously, three angels' messages, and then the right. fourth. Right. Which is... Um, so, I mean, you could argue that the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, this is sort of a counterfeit trinity, if you want to put it that way. But uh, I don't know if you would say it's a counterfeit three angels' messages. I mean, that would be hard to show. But he's saying he's taking almost that as the given, that they're a direct counterfeit to the three angels' messages, but also a counterfeit to the Godhead itself, Right. Like okay. normally we put it in, in that kind of sense, sense if if everyone already accepted the first idea. You know, maybe if he wrote it the other way, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are a counterfeit of the three of the Godhead, but also a counterfeit of the three angels' message. That you know, that would be something he'd have to try to prove. But it's not it's not even a, a sentence that, that fits with anything that he's under that he's presented, right? Like it's not he doesn't even need that sentence in there, right? It's just it's just a stray thought, right? It's not connected to anything. Non sequitur. Yeah, which he tends to do. He throws in these thoughts that really aren't aren't following through any kind of logical sequence, any explanatory power, any evidence. It's just there as you know. It's it's to maybe support his argument just by the fact that there are some words there. 
right? Be thinking about the content of them. And then, so he's going to say here, these three great persecuting powers are the highlight of the prophecy of Daniel 11. So, so he's making this argument, and they are the direct counterfeit of the three angels' messages. First off, they would not be the highlight. They could be <clears throat> a subject, but trying to present that these are the direct counterfeit doesn't fit. No. And then correctly understood, they reveal to us the strategy of Satan in this war. Now, so, so we have Satan. So Satan obviously has a strategy, and he uses these powers. But just because Satan uses them doesn't mean that these powers are united. Right? Correct. So, uh, now, I mean, it, it, he's trying to prove, and, and see, that's because he doesn't have his conclusion yet. He doesn't have part 13 up. You know, he's, I'm not sure exactly what he's trying to prove, but he's going to try to prove, I think, that the king of the north is is a godly power and the king of the south is a satanic power. That's That's what I'm gathering that he's going to conclude with because he's sort of pointing in that direction. But that's just, it doesn't make any sense. No, it wouldn't. But that seems to be that that's going to be the take that he has on Daniel 11, verse 40. But I just don't know how he's going to do that. You know, the only way I could think that he's going to do it is he's going to try to say, well, the king of the north, Christ is the king of the north. The king of the south coming against him is the satanic powers coming against him. And then the king of the north is going to conquer all of these kingdoms of the world. That's the only thing that I can think that he would have to try to argue so that he's coming up with a new interpretation of Daniel 11 verse 40. But it, it is really problematic if that's where he's going. But, you know, he hasn't told us, he doesn't tell us in the articles, but um, that must be where he's going. You know, if he's going to unite all of these powers as satanic powers opposed to the truth and that they can't fight against themselves. So he's arguing Satan can't be divided against Satan. So that means uh, the king of the north can't be a satanic power and the king of the south a satanic power. Right. Because then Satan would be divided against himself and he can't. Right. That, you know, that's his his basic premise. Correct. I'm not sure I came up with this idea. Anyway, go on. Okay. To understand the prophecy of Daniel 11, 31 to 45, is to correctly determine the spiritual nature of each player, whether it is a godly element or a satanic element. This goes to what you were just speaking yeah. Yeah. in reference yeah. to that. There are three places where it is possible to confuse this distinction. Verse 31, verse 40, and verse 41. The failure of the leading Adventist interpretations to accurately make this distinction in verse 31 regarding the daily is directly responsible for their failure to make the correct distinction regarding the kings of the south and the north in verse 40. As a result, this also holds true with Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon in verse 41. <clears throat> now, the fact that the major Adventist interpretations, those that are currently being accepted. Yeah, the leading Adventist interpretations, yeah. Not the pioneer interpretations. Mm -hmm not those presented by William Miller, James White, J.N. Loughborough, or um, Captain Bates, those that have come forth since, especially from Leroy Froome, Roy Allen Anderson, Mark Finley, and others, mm -hmm. are all trying to say that the daily is Christ's daily ministry. A godly power. A godly power so this would also lead to your you know the premise that you just presented as to a question regarding what's he trying to say in article 13 mm -hmm. but 
if he follows in that path, then he is more in agreement with the current Adventist interpreters. And he's arguing against the points that he himself is presenting. Yeah, see, because, yeah, they would say, well, the daily is a godly power and the abomination of desolation is satanic power. So then in verse 40, you would have, well, the king of the north is a godly power and the king of the south is a satanic power. That seems to be what he's saying. But but he would hold to the pioneer view of the day. Right. So <clears throat> in order to correctly identify the king of the south and the king of the north, it is necessary to take a closer look at the relation between the king of verse 36 and the king of the north. As we have seen, the leading Adventist interpretations take the papacy from his rightful place as the king of verse 36, and then repositions him as the king of the north. But is this correct? As with all of the prophecy, it is critical to get this piece right. In our next article, we will see clearly that this cannot be so. Right. So he's saying that the papacy is not the king of the north. That's it's interesting. But when we get into that article, I'm going to be shocked if he doesn't try to say that the papacy is the king of the north. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it, it is rather confusing what what his position is. Well, to be to be very blunt, this article is very much like a, a smoothie that starts out being made of fruit but to which are added kale garlic and onion and maybe some brewer's yeast and maybe some brewer's yeast is right and a bit of uh liquor syrup i'm just describing a a, a smoothie that my dad made once <laughs> really <laughs> well i'm Everybody looking at this and i'm i'm trying to i mean Given given that I do enjoy cooking, I'm imagining how all of these flavors would be a cacanfi of, of different tastes. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm taking from this article. Yeah. Once my dad made uh, an omelet with sprouts and licorice syrup. Yeah, so that's what kind of this reminds me of. Anyway. Yeah, so it, this doesn't really blend together very well. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, now we come to the next. See how fast my computer will open this. Now, you know, he's going to start with the sentence. Almost universally within Adventism, the king of the north of Daniel 11 is seen as the papacy. And I, I don't know about almost universally. I mean, it may be within certain factions of Adventism because we know that there's a huge group that is that wants to argue that the king of the north is turkey yeah so i'm not i'm not really sure i mean he must be aware of the turkey uh option because he's mentioned it before oh he's he's quite aware of that yeah so why would he say universally within adventism the king of the north of daniel 1140 is seen as the papacy that that seems very odd it is quite odd because he he could he could say that there is a disagreement within Adventism, whether the king of the north is the papacy or Turkey. Well, and then say, according we, to me, that it's the king, that, that it's the papacy, um, it's based upon the idea that the willful king of verse 36 is the papacy. But, but even here, nobody argues that this is a renewed or revived form as the king of the north. Right? Yeah. So anyway, read the, read the paragraph and then... Almost universally within Adventism, the king of the north of Daniel 1140 is seen as the papacy. According to this view, the papacy has been well established as the willful king of verse 36, but then assumes a renewed or revived form as the king of the north. It is portrayed as the papacy that is healed of its deadly wound. The context... No. Nobody does that. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so 
One is verse 40 does not show a revived papacy unless you're dealing with 40B. But in 40A, that's when it receives the deadly wound. It's not seen. It doesn't assume a renewed or revived form as the king of the north. It's the king of the north prior to even becoming the papacy because pagan Rome is the king of the north. It inherits that from from Rome. Right. OK. Now, again, let's let's take just a moment here. Daniel 1140. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So so he could be arguing that it's not the king of the north when the king of the south comes against him. It only becomes the king of the north in 1989. Is that what he would be arguing? I think he's trying to argue it from a broader scope, given where he is trying to address the healed of a deadly wound. Because we have often considered the healing of the deadly wound beginning with the issuance of the Lateran Treaty. Yeah, but the papacy is is the king of the north because pagan Rome was the king of the north. Right. Right. So, but he's he seems to be arguing here that it becomes the king of the north only when it's in its revived form. Which is a very strange way of looking at this. But of course, he's saying that according to this view, right? So what his view is exactly is not not clear. But but I know of nobody who has ever said this, right? And okay, so first he's saying almost universally within Adventism, the king of the north of Daniel 1140 is seen as the papacy. Now, so if he's referring to Daniel 11 verse 40b, we can we can say that that is not almost universally understood within Adventism. That would be something unique to this movement, right? Because we're going to take Daniel 11, verse 40b as being, you know, November 9th, 1989, right? Okay. So, so I don't know of, I don't know of, you know, definitely it's not universally within Adventism that that, that is seen as being at the time of the end you know, or like in our time, the second time of the end, that you're going to see Daniel 11, verse 40, B as being the papacy. So that's definitely not universal. But then he says, according to this view, the papacy has been well established as the willful king of verse 36, but only becomes the king of the north then in this renewed or revived form when the, when the deadly wound is healed. Have we ever made the argument? Have you ever seen anyone make the argument? that the papacy only becomes the king of the north at the time of the end in 1989, but is not the king of the north in 1798. I've not heard that from anyone. No. So so obviously in this view that the king of the north is the papacy, it's not true that according to this view, what he's saying, right? Now, if he's saying that it's portrayed as the papacy that is healed of its deadly wound, even within this movement, we don't argue that the deadly wound has has yet been fully healed, right? Okay. R- right. It's it's the papacy, even though this works in it with the United States to overthrow the Soviet Union, like uh, pagan Rome when it arises, it comes onto the scene early, but doesn't conquer until later, right? This is a point Jeff has made. So that so the deadly wound being healed, you know. It, isn't the latter in treaty. It isn't you know, November 9th, 1989. It's going to be healed at the Sunday law. Right. That's the position that we've taken. So I just don't know of anybody who presents this view that he presents in the first paragraph. And yet he calls it almost universally within Adventism. This is the view. Yeah, this. This is not a universal understanding in any regard. Mm-hmm. And, and definitely the next paragraph. The context that drives this view is the long-standing belief that the king of the south fights against the king of the north, who then responds with overwhelming force. Well, I mean, 
obviously that's what the verse says, but that, so everybody believes that whether they believe the king of the North is the papacy or not, or the king of the South is, um, you know, atheism or whatever, right? Or France, you, you understand what I'm saying? So if you're not going to believe that the king of the South fights against the king of the North and then the king of the North responds with overwhelming force, then you would not believe that verse because that's what it plainly says. Now, we are, there are people who think that the battle is not between the king of the North and the king of the South, that they're going to think it's between France and the king of the North and France and the king of the South, right? Okay. But is he, is he rejecting that longstanding belief? You know, I mean, the whole thing doesn't make any sense what he's trying to argue. Like, if you don't know what the person is trying to get at, it, it's pretty difficult uh, to, <laughs> to know what he's trying to get at, um, you know, to understand it. Anyway, go on. Okay. The context that drives this view is the longstanding belief that the king of the south fights against the king of the north who then responds with overwhelming force. So this statement is true, but on the heels of his universally understood view of the papacy being the king of the north, I'm 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 just aghast. I don't I don't have a, a point. I yeah, don't know well, what else to say. So one of the things he's doing, you know, in, in that second paragraph. Um, he says, you know, the context that drives this view is the longstanding belief. Well, that's, I'm not sure what he means by the context that drives, but the idea that drives this view is a longstanding belief. And what he's going to do then is attack longstanding beliefs. So the argument is it's a longstanding belief and longstanding beliefs are wrong. Right. Right. That That's the argument. Right. So, it's almost the fact that somebody has has a belief that's been around for a long time. For him, that almost discredits it, right? That That's the argument he's going to have against it. Not a biblical argument, just the fact that it's a longstanding belief that should bring it into question, which, of course, is, is a bad argument. Right. Now, in this article, we will be looking to see if the papacy has indeed taken on the role of the king of the north. So here he's questioning, has the papacy become the king of the north? And if the king of the south and the king of the north are actually engaged in a conflict with each other. So now he's questioning, is the king of the south coming to battle against the king of the north? As we focus in on these particular points, we would do well to consider again the reason that both the Jews and the Millerites missed the correct interpretation of the present truth for their time. Now, here he gives a quotation from the Great Controversy. Here he uses a reddish highlight, which he is normally used as being for scripture. So, Normally, when he's quoting this with great controversy, he's been using the the highlight of bolding portions of it. Mm -hmm. So the quote that he uses, in both cases, there was an acceptance of, or rather an adherence to popular errors that blinded the mind to the truth, and that errors that had been long established in the church prevented them from arriving at a correct interpretation of an important point of the prophecy. So instead of placing an ellipse that he is quoting part of a sentence or part of a paragraph, he segues to say that he can make the application and join these two sentences to make sense. Yeah, so they're from two different pages of Great Controversy. He connects them together, so. Correct. The light says these two different sentences. So if I was if I was to take a moment with, with that, and again, my computer is running 
quite slow. <clears throat> and we opened up the great controversy. But yeah, it, I mean, it, it's true that there are errors that led them to make mistakes. But he's using this almost in the case of the fact that they did long established errors. So he's making an argument that a long established, something being long established should bring question about it. Like we shouldn't just accept, oh, and obviously we shouldn't just accept something just because we believed it for a long time. Okay. But, but he's used it almost as an argument that it's not true, right? Okay. You, you got 351. Okay. This is, this is where I get, I, I have further heartburn. The portion that he quotes second is actually Great Controversy 351, paragraph two. Yeah, so he's got them in reverse order. Correct. But this paragraph reads, like the first disciples, William Miller and his associates did not themselves fully comprehend the import of the message which they bore. Errors that had been long established in the church prevented them from arriving at a correct interpretation of an important point in the prophecy. Therefore, though they proclaimed the message which God had committed to them to be given to the world, yet through a misapprehension of its meaning, they suffered disappointment. Quite honestly, if I was going to make an application with this particular paragraph and this particular section, I would be making it regarding July 18th of 2020. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm looking here. That paragraph comes after the famous paragraph in 351 regarding the preaching of each was based upon a fulfillment of a different portion of the same great prophetic period. Okay. Right. So, um, so this is going to be, they, they didn't fully understand the import of the message which they bore. So, so this is not like, it's not leading them to some fundamental error in understanding prophecy because they were actually led to proclaim this, but that they didn't fully understand the importance of their message, right? Correct. They gave a correct message. Where he's trying to apply this to the fact of an interpretation of a verse which means that we were completely wrong about how we understood these verses, which would completely undo any message that, that this movement has proclaimed regarding these verses. It's, it's not just um, some error, popular error, that made us not recognize the importance of what we were presenting, but it would actually be an error that means what we were presenting was absolute error and uh, basically not true at all, right? If okay. he's going to apply this, right? So Ellen White is not using this to say that the Millerites were wrong in proclaiming October twenty second, eighteen forty four. Basically, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. And even with the next paragraph one in Great Controversy two fifty two, paragraph three. Okay. Those who proclaim this warning gave the right message at the right time. But the, as the early disciples declared, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, based on the prophecy of Daniel 9. While they failed to perceive that the death of the Messiah was foretold in the same scripture. So Miller and his associates preached the message based on Daniel 8.14 and Revelation 14.7 and failed to see that there was still other messages brought to view in Revelation 14, which were also to be given before the advent of the Lord. As the disciples were mistaken in regard to the kingdom to be set up at the end of the 70 weeks, so Adventists were mistaken in regard to the event to take place at the expiration of the 2300 days. In both cases, there was an acceptance of, or rather an adherence to, popular errors that blinded the mind to the truth, period. Both classes fulfilled the will of God in delivering the message which he had desired to be given, and both, through their own misapprehension of their message, 
suffered disappointment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's reversed what we're looking at and what we should be seeing. It's, I, I'm just, I'm thrown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he's misusing these quotes. Right. So uh, he's just going to basically do away with our understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40. Correct. But I mean, the, the other part of this, he wants to he wants to provide this quote from Great Controversy 351.2. He wants to jump to 352.3 when, in fact, the quotes are reversed. Mm -hmm. But there's so much explanation in between that stands against the point that he's trying to make. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So if if someone else can explain this to me, if someone else can show me where I'm wrong, I'm willing to accept that I'm wrong and admit that I'm wrong. But I'm having a problem with the way that this is being presented. Does anyone mm -hmm. else have that same problem? Well, I do. I'm sure other people could speak up for themselves if they have problems with what's being presented here. And that that's what I'm asking. Well, they so, don't seem to speak up, but... But, but, so we're going to have to assume their silence is uh, compliance. <laughs> this is why I'm giving everybody a chance. I mean, I, I don't like taking silence in the ascent. Yes. I know. Okay. I mean, that's what the government assumes. Our silence, is the, you know, means what we agree. Well, it's kind of confused, and I'm on the way to it. Okay. Well, well, the next paragraph doesn't follow from what he's just said. The, the, next, the next paragraph for me is attempting to mix oil and water. These then become the two questions to ask. How did the papacy suddenly become the king of the north? And are the kings of the south and kings of the north of verse 40 engaged in a conflict against each other? Does the Bible support either of these views? Now, brothers and sisters, we've studied this multiple times. We have addressed this multiple times. We have heard Elder Jeff, Dwayne Dewey, and many others that have covered this subject. Are the king of the north and the king of the south in conflict with each other? And does the Bible support that view? Mm -hmm. And also, the papacy doesn't suddenly become the king of the north. That verb should never have been added. Yeah, because but because that's implying, you know, something that that nobody believes. Nobody believes that the papacy all of a sudden just became the king of the north. We understand how this occurs historically, what it inherits from Babylon to become the king of the north. I mean. Is Babylon representative of the papacy? I would think yes. It's pretty clear. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. If if Babylon, is Babylon the king of the north? Yes, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so the papacy has to be the king of the north. I mean, this is one of the arguments to argue that, you know, Turkey is the king of the north when at the end of time we understand these things symbolically. That we're not going to take, you know, whoever controls that territory as being the king of the north. Because this is this we, we're living in a time when these are symbols, right? Now, literally, there was a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south as far as the divisions of the Greek Empire. But when you get down to the end of time, we're not dealing with Greece anymore, right? Rome has conquered Greece. Rome becomes the king of the north. It passes that title on to the papacy. I mean, it, it's such a simple idea. It's not not complicated. And then he says, does the Bible support either of these views? He's not really going to even do an argument to discredit this, right? He's he's going to use some smoke and mirrors to try to 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 answer these questions. He's not really going to answer them. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's going to use smoke. <laughs> so, so he's going to use Islam? I, don't yeah, I, 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 I knew you were thinking that. <laughs> um, 
But, but you know, you obviously understand what I'm saying here. So right. he's going to present one of Miller's rules, which he's not going to follow. Now, every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Rule number one, Miller's rules. Now, now what does that, that mean when we say every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible? Now, there are people when they read a passage, they 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 want to understand that passage all by itself without reference to other verses. Right? I Protestants do that all the time. If you if if you you have an evangelical and you want to do a Bible study and you're looking at a passage and you start looking at other verses to to explain that passage, they don't like that. Right? They will say, "No, we need to understand this passage as it stands by itself." And and I would say rule number 1 is is declaring that we have to take every place in the Bible where those words are used, right? Okay. Is that my rule number one? That's what I understand, that that's every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. So what the subject is, not the passage presented in the Bible, but the subject, right? Where he's going to actually just try to look at the passage. So he's interpreting this rule from what I can see as no we just look at the words of that passage that's what we have to do every word must have its proper bearing of the passage presented in the Bible that's what I think he thinks the rule means well right because he's going to say we need to correctly identify the subject so the rest of the words of the prophecy can have their proper bearing that's what he's going to say in his next paragraph you can read it right but I'm I'm looking and I'm asking this question for for consideration today. What is the proof that Father Miller used in establishing this rule? Well, he used Matthew 5, verse 18. Which states, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Now, in this situation, would these words of the Savior be giving reference to the time of the end? I don't know what you mean by the time of the end. I mean, all, all the words of Scripture stand for all time. Correct. And they will all be fulfilled. Correct. But is this giving a reference for us to be able to understand that? At the time. Correct. Okay. Well, yeah. Because... Because some people will say, well, you know, the Bible just had application to the past. Doesn't really apply to us now. Right. right. Which would be sort of preterism. But, I mean, what Miller is arguing is that we have to take all of Scripture in order to understand a subject. And, and he's going to turn this rule on its head. He's, he's going to totally undo what, what Miller's saying in, in his paragraph following Okay. Right. So read the next paragraph. He's he's not agreeing with Miller at all. He's actually directly contradicting Miller's rule. Okay. Comment from the chat quick. Comment in the chat states that we should look at Matthew twenty four thirty five, which say heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that that goes to this point about every word having it proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Now, the paragraph that you're, you're referencing now, it is of interest to note that the very first rule of Miller's rules deals with the subject. In fact, the first three rules set the precedent for the remainder of the rules. With that in mind, it is of the utmost importance that we correctly identify the subject so the rest of the words of the prophecy can have their proper bearing. I'm having a problem, again, because Father Miller states that every word, he doesn't say that every subject, every verb, every predicate should be studied. It's every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Yeah, so this is not what Miller's rule is saying at all. Correct. So what he's saying is what? I've run into you know, with people, they say, 
But we need to understand the context, the subject that's being presented here. And we can't confuse it by looking at other scriptures. Right. Right. So so in order to understand what, what's being said, the words, what he's arguing is that in order to understand the words, we need to know what the subject is. So we have to decide what this subject is before we can even properly inter- interpret the verse. Right. But he has no way of identifying what the subject is but see, because he can make it up. But see here, he now wants to jump. The king of the south and the king of the north are not the subject of the prophecy, but receive their bearing from the subject, the king of verse 36. Which is silly. I mean, to be polite. Like, it, it just, that's, that's how people just twist the scriptures. That's the point I was about to make. Yeah. I'm, again, I'm having real problem. I'm not in agreement with this presentation at all. <clears throat> because he is stating that the king of verse 36 is different from the king of the north and the king of the south. And since verse 36 reads, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done now i'm having a problem here because my understanding has always been this has given us reference to one of the phases of rome but here in this statement it's basically being presented that Rome is not the king of verse 36. That that's separate from the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, am, am I wrong in my, in, in the conclusion I have arrived at? No. So, you, you know, going through these articles, it seems like he hadn't really thought everything through when he started writing. You know, so that analogy of, you know, starting making a fruit smoothie and ending up with uh, a garlic uh, kale smoothie sort of applies. It, it's almost like he's changed his mind as he's gone through this or he's like he he's struggling with something. Right. But he hasn't he hasn't sorted it out yet. And so he starts with this. This idea that maybe, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south you know, that he has this new answer to this problem, right? That the, that, that the, they can't be divided against themselves. He starts with this premise that, well, Satan can't be fighting against Satan. So why are we having the king of the north, these yeah. satanic powers fighting against each other? Which, of course, is not what the verse means. Doesn't mean that uh, nations that are satanic don't fight against themselves, right? So So he's brought us here to this point where now he's going to, decide for us what the subject of a prophecy is with no way of determining what the subject is. Like the subject is the subject. It it tells you what the subject is. You don't say, well, this, this is not the subject that the subject is this other thing. And, and he's ignoring the whole context because I think that's, you know, what we would need to do to understand what Daniel 11 is about Daniel's last vision is addressing it's telling us what the vision is about it's really about an understanding of the 2520 right that's what we determined and that 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 has sort of been missed out and people have been focused just upon you know what history is it representing so you do need to know uh the context of why the prophecy is given in the first place but it's going to tell you that it's not something you have to guess at and you know, this idea of guessing at its meaning, which Miller objects to, the idea that we just guess. Right. We have rules that we can follow so that we can understand how to interpret the passage. Now, it doesn't mean we're always going to follow those rules correctly and always get it right because our knowledge is limited and we may not have considered everything. But here, he's now proposing something 
that's not evident at all from the passage. And to argue that, because he's arguing that the king of the north and the king of the south can't, neither of them can be the king of verse 36, right? Which, which there's no reason that you would argue that, right? You, you can't, there's nothing that's telling you that the king of the north and the king of the south have nothing to do with the king of verse 36, that it's, that they're, neither of them are the king of verse 36. Especially since you know, it's pretty clear that the, that the king of the south is going to come against this king of verse 36. And that that king is the king of the north. Because we've already established that, that the king of the north is Rome. Because it inherits that territory. And then that's passed on to the papacy. Right. And this doesn't, and in other words, previous to verse 31, the kings of the south and north operate within the confines of their relationship to paganism. Doesn't even make any sense. Well, this is going to be something we're going to delve into a bit further tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. And tomorrow I have to quit a little bit early, so we can't go to 903 tomorrow, but because I have to do something at nine o'clock. But anyway. Okay. It's interesting. It's kind of discouraging. It's a hard thing for me because I'm going to have to write a letter in order to put my thoughts and make my thoughts cogent. And I don't like having to write this kind of a letter to an old friend. Yeah. All right. Any other comments, thoughts, or questions at this time? Shall we then close this session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we lay all of this before you today. We need your guidance and your direction in all the things that you would have us to do. Please direct our steps today. Please guide us in all ways so that which is done may be done according to your will. Do that which is necessary so that we may follow you and that your will may be done and that we may be able <clears throat> to properly and rightly divide the word of truth. Bless our efforts today. Guide us in all that you would have for us to do. Keep us each one safe. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.